Um, a number of you asked questions after last class. Forgive me. A number of you asked questions after last class, and the questions fell into two bins. So I'll try to ask them as, answer them as larger questions. One was, why is it that we, meaning you, are competing with a portfolio of randomly selected stocks? Why don't I pick stocks I think are going to go up? To which I say, ha, 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 ha. If I knew stocks that were going to go up, I would have bought them. So with other people, they would already have gone up and the price would already capitalize that information. All stocks must be as likely to go up as down or they would have a different price. All stocks must be as likely to go up as down or they would have a different price. Now, the amount that they might go up or down will depend on risk and correlation with other things in the economy. But if you know for a fact that a stock is priced incorrectly, that would be remarkable. You should leave class right now and go trade on that information, because that's a sure thing. Now, there are sure things, and they're called inside information. My first job out of graduate school was working for the US Federal Trade Commission. One of the things the US Federal Trade Commission does is enforce the antitrust laws, including the Clayton Act, the Sherman Act, Robinson-Patman. So the legislation that tries to prevent companies from either being monopolies or acting as monopolies. One of the key aspects of that regulatory authority, and we'll talk some about this today, is jurisdiction over mergers and acquisitions. So while I was there, Pepsi tried to buy 7-Up. Pepsi tried to buy 7-Up. One soft drink company tried to buy another. Now the question is, does that create a monopoly? Where our, this was during the Reagan administration, so our rule for finding monopoly was rank the firms in the industry from largest to smallest and then count them. If there's one, it's a monopoly. Again, that's an economics joke, it's not funny. If there's more than one, it's not a monopoly. And there still would have been more than one company in this industry. Coke, for example. Diet Right Cola. A bunch of other companies would still have been there. Plus, you can drink other things. Water, orange juice, milk, iced tea. So the definition of the industry is important. But suppose that I had known the day before it was announced what the decision was going to be on the merger petition between Pepsi and 7-Up. Pepsi and 7-Up had stock prices that were priced in between what would happen if the petition were denied and if it were accepted. As soon as the information is revealed, it will go to one or the other price. I could have traded on that information. Why would I not have done that? Because men with guns would come to my house and handcuff me and take me to prison. That's called insider trading. Insider trading is when someone who has information as a result of being part of a regulatory process trades on that information. They're pretty careful about trying to police that. So it is possible to know that a stock is going to go up or down if you have insider information. Generally, if you got that information because you have some privileged status as a government employee or as CEO of a corporation, you're not allowed to trade on that information. But if you have information that a stock is going to go up, by all means trade on it after you tell me. Call me first. All right, so the answer to your question why didn't I buy stocks that I thought were going to go up is, I have no idea what stocks are going to go up. That's why I chose a randomly selected portfolio, because oddly, that will do better. 10 randomly selected stocks on average will do better than almost anything else. And the people that are better than that all make a living from it, a big living. If you can consistently beat a randomly selected portfolio of stocks, you can make an excellent living at that, because that's really hard. So that's the reason. Second, 
The second question that I got was, but can't you imagine, this was after the lecture on Monday, can't you imagine a government subsidy that actually benefits the public? Well, yes. I'm going to New York tomorrow and I can imagine that I'm going to fly using my arms. But that's not a very good policy to follow and so I booked an airplane. So my flying will be inside an airplane rather than imagining that I can fly using my arms. The question is not, can we imagine subsidies that benefit the public? Of course we can. The question is, will the actual political process that we have in a democracy that's dominated by large, powerful interest groups, do we expect that the actual pattern of subsidies will benefit the public or those large, powerful interest groups? Don't you think that large corporations will be the ones that attract those subsidies? Now, once you put it on those grounds, yes, I still think that there are some subsidies, and of course, since I work in the education industry, I think subsidies to my industry, to education, are completely merited, except in my more rational moments when I realize maybe it's not such a good idea. But in terms of self-interest, of course, I want my own industry to be subsidized. Everybody does. And we're clever. We have good reasons for why it should be true. You have to evaluate those claims recognizing that political processes and market processes both have flaws. It's not true that since markets are flawed, we can assume or imagine a perfect political process. However, it's also not true that since political processes are, are flawed, we should choose markets because we can imagine those to be perfect. The ideal competitive model of markets is also imaginary. So both of the two perfections are imaginary, which is a really disappointing thing to have to face because it means that the policy prescriptions of that realization are always going to be case by case. What's the best thing to do? And the answer is always it depends. At the end of this class, you'll have more of an idea of what it depends on. There are many people who would characterize the argument for capitalism, as you're about to hear in this movie clip. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed, in all of its forms, greed for life, money, for love, knowledge, has marked upward surge of mankind, and greed, you mark my words, will not only say it tells our paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. Well, that was Michael Douglas in the first uh, Wall Street movie. And that movie was made by Oliver Stone, who is no fan of capitalism. And yet, that's, argument, that's often the argument that you hear made in favor of capitalism, is that it rewards greed. It's probably not true, if by greed you mean taking things from other people. The way that entrepreneurs make profits is to create value for customers. The way that almost all economic agents make profits, or wages, or rents to capital is to create value for their customer. Now, there are certainly circumstances where that's not true. And you could easily imagine perhaps Donald Trump giving the same speech that you just heard and believing it. Not that I mean in any way to criticize Donald Trump. But that sort of simplistic view of capitalism is one that I hope you'll be able to put aside. So the reason that we're spending so much time on rent seeking and profits is to distinguish greed from self-interest. Greed motivates rent-seeking. Self-interest is a much broader concept. It's often in my self-interest to create value for my customers and treat them well. But that's different from greed. Self-interest leads me to try to, do, to build a product that people want to buy, a product that works, that they'll continue to buy, because that's the way that I make profits whereas greed leads to rent-seeking.
So on Monday, we learned that politics decides at the median. That can be useful. It's often useful. Movements or changes at the fringe don't affect the median. But innovations occur at the margin, not the middle. Remember John Kenneth Galbraith said, in economics, things happen at the margin. The majority is always wrong. Let's look at two examples. And this comes from that reading that you had, two Steves and one Soichiro. In the late 1950s, the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry thought that they would fix the Japanese automobile industry. There was all this destructive competition. So what we'll have instead is just two companies, Toyota and Nissan. Those will get government financial support. They would be subsidized. All the other companies are going to be told to direct their energies to motorcycles or blenders or those new television things. Costs are going to fall because each company would have economies of scale. There's going to be fewer producers, lower costs, more profits for everyone, and the government subsidies would be repaid. But there was this guy, Soichiro. He was kind of prickly. He didn't want to listen to Miti or anyone else. They sold really good, high-performance motorcycles, and he thought that those engines would work in cars. So in 1959, in spite of Miti trying to close him down, he started selling cars. The first one he sold was the S360. Now, of course, you know that his last name is Honda. Japanese government tried to shut down the Honda Motor Company. This is the first motorcycle that he sold. This is from 1947. It's not much of a motorcycle, but it's better than just riding a bike. Now, we think of Honda as being an indispensable participant in competition to provide good cars. And to be fair, there are plenty of people who think of Honda cars as, well, as I said, they're indispensable. In 1976, there were two Steves in a garage. One worked for Hewlett Packard, the other one for Atari. The Atari guy had the garage and the two Steves worked together on a machine called, they called Apples. They called it a Macintosh. I don't know if you've ever seen the old Macintosh. They didn't have any memory. There was just a, you may have seen it in a, in a museum. And they decided to sell them for $666.66. What could possibly go wrong? The price of the devil. Well, they didn't sell all that many of them. They were called Apple Ones. So suppose we had taken a vote at that point on the personal computer. Most people would have guessed there was no future in it. And in fact, since that was $2,350 for something that had no fixed memory and 16K of RAM, you have far more memory than that in your watch. And I don't mean an Apple watch, I mean just a regular di digital watch. No government agency would have funded that thing. And in fact, they shouldn't have because the median voter by far thought this was a terrible idea. And Jobs and Wozniak were both very poor, and they wouldn't have been big campaign contributors. And there was no grassroots wave of support, since no one even knew who the Steves were or what they were trying to accomplish. But they were out at the extreme of opinions. They were out at the margin, and markets operate at the margin. So 1976, they moved out of the garage. 1980, they sold an Apple III, which is about 9,000 today. They still didn't sell much, except that they had a public stock offering. They had an IPO. And they sold 4.6 million shares. Now, the United States has 300 million people. 4.6 million is not very many. Even if people only bought one, that would be less than 5 million people out of 300 million. And in fact, the people who bought these bought quite a few. So there's less than 100,000 people that thought Apple was going to make it. Nowhere near the median voter. Now, obviously, I'm selecting on success here. You could say, yes, but what about all the failures? Well, what about all the failures? What do we know about the failures? We know that private money was risked on those. No public money was risked. And the people who were risking their money had an incentive to try to make sure that things worked. Whereas if I can get subsidies, I can just take that money and shut down. So 
a few people made a yes bet when everybody else was betting no. And you have to say the conventional wisdom was probably correct. The business editor at Prentice Hall said, and this is typical of business editors. I mean, after all, he was hired as business editor. He should know stuff. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country, and I've talked with the best people, meaning my friends. And I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last out the year. Well, it was 1957. You know, maybe it was early enough. He had a point, although it did last more than a year. The microchip was invented in 1968 and engineers at IBM's advanced computing system. This is at IBM. This is at IBM. Said, but what is it good for? So these are people who had pretty good reasons to know. They thought people who were going to use microchips were crazy. Ken Olson, the founder of DEC, the computer company, in 1978 said, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. And remember, this is a person who sells computers. So if anything, he has a reason to be optimistic on the other side. Majorities are always wrong. They're always wrong about innovation. It is the nature of innovation that majorities are always wrong. And in politics, majorities dominate. There's just no way to get innovations out of politics. So he was right. 95% of the population was voting no, but we didn't vote. We left it up to capitalism. We left it up to individuals at the extreme. By 85, 5% had voted yes. Finally, in 2005, 25 years after the margin recognized the value of PCs, the median changed his mind. More than 60% of households had at least one computer, and eventually most of the rest of us came along free riding on the correct guess. So here's the thing. One of the articles that y'all read at the beginning was the problem of the seen and the unseen. How do we value innovations that don't exist? How could you possibly value innovations that don't exist? That is, innovations that never happened because we use politics instead of markets. Well, we don't know about them. It is the nature of that kind of choice that we don't know about them. So. Let me give some definitions, because I've thrown these words around without defining them very carefully. Opportunity cost is the value foregone in using an asset or your time in a particular way. Opportunity cost is what you give up by using something in a particular way. A rent is a return above the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the next best use. Rent is whatever value you get that's over and above the opportunity cost. Profit is the excess of revenues over cost in producing and selling a product or time. So to be fair, profit is a kind of rent. But we're, we've been defining rent as attempting to give away money in the form of a transfer. Rent seeking, then, is the resources that are used up or dissipated in pursuit of a rent. So the problem is not rents. The problem is rent seeking. And let me illustrate that. Suppose, and I've done this in smaller classes, suppose I were to hold up a $20 bill and say I'm going to auction off this $20 bill. How much will you pay me for it? Now. The provision is, all of you have to put your bid in an envelope, and I keep all the bids. All of you put your bid in an envelope, and I keep all the bids. That's called an all-pay auction. How much would you pay? Well, probably 50 of you would pay at least a dollar. Some of you would pay six or eight dollars. Somebody might pay 19, thinking that they'll get it. I can make $100 by selling 20. The problem is that rent seeking is not just auctioning off money, it's auctioning off money and then burning the bids. Because all of the effort that goes to seeking the rent is wasted. If we have a contest for who could balance a stick on their nose the longest, and 100 people entered, and the winner gets $10, well, everybody else gets nothing, but they wasted time trying to balance a stick on their nose. So their bid in this auction 
since it's whoever does it the most wins, their bid in the auction is wasted, is dissipated. The problem with rent seeking is that it's an all pay auction where the bids are burned. Rent seeking is an all pay auction where the bids are burned. So the extent to which a rent is a problem is not the rent itself. The problem is the extent to which it induces rent seeking. So that's the distinction I think I failed to make clear on Monday that I'm going to try to make clearer now. Profits are the excess of revenue from selling a product. Entrepreneurs seek product, therefore they're trying to create value. Rent seeking is a competition for an artificial prize or benefit that's either taking money from taxpayers and transferring it or a restriction on competition. So maybe a regulation like Miti tried to do that says Nissan and Toyota will be the only car companies. Nobody else is allowed to compete with them. That's a very valuable law. It creates a rent that those two companies can make monopoly profits on. So the caricature is if you're seeking profits, you hire engineers. If you're seeking rents, you hire lawyers and lobbyists. My wife is an attorney. I don't mean in any way to denigrate attorneys. Attorneys are an important part of doing business. But if all you're doing is hiring lawyers, you're not creating value. You're just trying to protect yourself from competition. So profits are produced as a result of making products that people want to buy and doing it at a cost less than the value people place on the product. Rents are extracted by manipulating the terms of trade or creating an artificial price. So, let's try to classify. And you've seen this problem before. It may be hard to tell. What did they do at Hogwarts? They used the sorting hat. So, you got to decide which of the groups you joined. Can you tell whether something is rent-seeking or profit-seeking? Well, the core piece of information is how to direct resources. If more people are willing to pay a sufficient amount to cover the cost of production and distribution, plus a premium, then that activity is socially desirable. It creates value. Methamphetamine. Well, maybe not. And the thing is, it probably actually does create value to people in the sense that they're willing to pay for it, which means that my example may not be right. Does methamphetamine actually hurt people? Well, I think so. Should it be illegal? People make big profits from it. So this may not be as simple as what I, maybe methamphetamine is, production is also rent seeking. In what way would it be rent seeking? Well, there's artificial monopoly profits that are created by the enforcement of the state in limiting the amount of methamphetamine that's produced, which means that it's far more profitable to produce illegal drugs like crack or meth because of government policy. People go into that industry because of government policy. It may still be justified if the damage to consumers is so enormous. But is methamphetamine profit-seeking or rent-seeking? Gosh, it's hard to say. So I raised the example precisely because it's difficult. The Tulloch auction, though, anything that looks like a Tulloch auction, which was the example of selling a $20 bill and then burning the bids, named after a guy named Smith. No! Tulloch. See, I wanted to wake you up. Gordon Tulloch was the one who came up with this idea. And what's interesting is if I try to give something away, but in effect I auction it, I can give it away, but if I try to auction it, people will bid, and if the bids just don't take the form of money, but take the form of some competitive action, all of the competition is wasted. So the more it looks like that, the more it's rent seeking. So while I can't give you the sorting hat, I can give you a way of identifying. The more it looks like a telic auction, the more it's just rent seeking. So Ronaldo for Real Madrid, Perrier water to some extent, because it's naturally carbonated. Protection from competition by state action. 
private contracts in restraint of trade, whether they be price fixing, oligopolistic collusion. Now, there's a debate over whether we should have antitrust laws. And the common law solution was interesting. What the common law solution was, was simply to say that any contract in restraint of trade is not enforceable in court. Any contract in restraint of trade is not enforceable in court. So I'm General Motors and you're Ford, and we agree with each other that we will keep our prices 20% over our costs, thereby guaranteeing ourselves profits. Well, we have really big incentives to cheat because I can sell a lot more cars if it's only 15% over my costs. You sue me saying, look, we have an agreement. You said you would charge at least 20% over your cost. Well, the court says, don't be ridiculous. This contract's not enforceable. No, we will not enforce it. That's different than an antitrust authority that actually punishes these. So at a minimum, you would want to make contracts in restraint of trade not enforceable. But that means that it's not true that we agree to enforce all voluntary contracts. The courts do not agree to enforce all voluntary contracts. Some contracts, and we're going to talk about later, contracts that have externalities or affect third people. Contracts that have externalities or affect third parties are generally not going to be enforceable. Sometimes they won't be enforceable because we regulate the activity, and sometimes we just won't enforce the contract. Do we need antitrust? Well, interestingly, Adam Smith himself has a famous quote. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So the private sector has plenty of rent seeking also, because this is rent seeking. This is not profit seeking. These are agreements in restraint of trade that create a rent, an artificial prize. So there's plenty of rent seeking in the private sector also. Now it may be that competition is the tonic that cures that. But it's unlikely that competition is going to be enough in all cases, especially in very concentrated industries. Still, rent seeking privately, at least potentially, there's the answer of outside competition. If not now, then soon. So maybe Sony was making a lot of money from Walkmans. But Apple came in with iPods and wiped them out. So even if they did have something close to a monopoly, competition can wipe out those rents. Whereas if the state has created a prize or the state has created a restriction, there's no way around it. There's no competition. Well, as I said before, what about in sports? What about people who practice basketball or football or hockey or volleyball because they want to be professional volleyball players? Some of them but mo will make it, but most will not. Is that effort wasted? Well, it's the sport itself that is the product, so probably not. But there's some part of it where the bid is burned. There's a famous example. Some of you had asked, is it ever justified? Would it ever be justified for the government to create a prize? And there's a famous book by Joan Dash, The Longitude Prize. England faced a problem in the 17th century. Their sailors had maps from which they could tell their latitude. And latitude is how far you are north and south. Longitude, though, tells you how far you are east or west. You need to know both to know your location on a map. If you only know one, maybe you're a mile and maybe you're 100 yards from a really rocky island. And in the middle of the night, Knowing where you are can be the difference between wrecking your ship or not. So they needed to know exact locations. To do that, they needed a particular thing. Does anybody know what it was? Well, the sextant, uh, is, is you cite on the stars, and that's what allows you to do longitude. You're right that that's important. They needed that. So in a way, I was saying, can you guess what I'm thinking now? A sextant is absolutely right. 
but they also needed another thing in order to be able to tell their location. A compass gives them position. I'm, I'm going to stop playing. Can you, can you guess what I'm thinking now? I'm sorry. Because you need that too. So both answers are right, but it, it's not what I was thinking. What I was thinking is a clock. You need to know what time it is. Because what you need to know is to use your sextant to tell the angle between the star and the horizon. That's what a sextant does. You need to use your compass to tell which way is north and south so you can find your position. But that angle at a particular time, you can then look up in a table and find your exact longitude. So what they needed was a clock that was accurate for six months at sea within one minute. They have to have a clock that's accurate for six months at sea. The ship is rolling around. Doing it on land wouldn't be so hard. But having a clock that's accurate for six months at sea with salt water around was very difficult. So they offered a prize of 100,000 pounds. Hundreds of people worked on this problem. All but one failed in the sense that someone delivered a clock that now to us would look pretty strange. But there can't be, the problem is there can't be a swinging pendulum. They had very accurate clocks, but they all operated on a swinging pendulum. You can't have a swinging pendulum. It has to be with springs or something else. It has to work with gears. Well, solving this problem created millions, probably billions of pounds of value in the sense that British shipping and other ships were able to sail much closer to coastlines because they knew their exact location. So yes, I can think of examples where prizes do create enough value for the public that even a Tullock auction might be justified. Because not only the person that invented the clock who got the 100,000 pounds, but all the other people used up all the time that they had in creating this. But in this case, there was something of value. And in fact, once you start thinking this way, what do I hope to get if I go to get an invention? I have an invention and I go to the Walmart to sell it? No, I go to the patent office. The patent is a rent. The patent creates for me a monopoly right to be able to sell that idea. So patents are rents also. But we might conceivably want to give something like patents or copyrights. I'm a, I'm a book author and so I care about copyrights. All of those are rents. So you can, it's pretty easy to think of examples where having a government created rent, a property right, would be justified for public purposes. The problem is to the extent that it's more like a Tullock auction than something that creates value, then it's bad public policy. And I wish I could be more specific. This is a hard problem. People would like to have a bright line and I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that the more it's like I'm putting up money for sale and keeping all the bids which will then be burned, the worse it is for public policy. The more it's like the longitude prize, the better it is public policy. So rent seeking is trying to capture an artificially protected gain. Profit seeking is creating a value in a way that allows the capture of a surplus. Anybody ever read the William Faulkner novel, The Reavers? It was also a movie with Steve McQueen. There's Steve McQueen in the back of the fliver there trying to lever it out. Well, there were these people in the Reavers that called themselves mud farmers. Now, if I'm a corn farmer, I grow corn. Mud farmers did not grow mud. What they did instead was they would go out in front of the, their farm on the road and they would pour wagon load after wagon load of water in a low spot. And then they would plow the low spot with a plow and then water it again until the mud is four or five feet deep. And then they would put straw on top of it so you couldn't tell it was muddy. And then a car would come by and the farmer would just happen to have his horse hitched up and come out and say, damn, that car stuck deep. Nobody else around here. I could pull you out be a hundred dollars. 
$100, that's crazy. I mean, you've got the horse right there. Why don't you just help me? Sorry, can't. Guess I'll head back to the house. Let me know you changed your mind. Okay, pull it out. Now, the car is worth $500. So paying $100 for it, in terms of putting that in perspective, is outrageous. So the guy gets back in his car and he's furious. He's paid 100 bucks. He starts driving fast. He's not paying attention. He goes half a mile. He sees some more straw. He runs into the straw and his car sinks because the next farmer has done the same thing. And the same thing plays out. $100. That's crazy. That's too much. He may end up spending $700 for his car that costs $500 because he spends $100 and $100 and 100 and every time it makes sense because he's comparing the value of his car stuck in the mud that he can't get out. So mud farmers are not just rent seekers. Mud farmers are people who manipulate the rules to create a rent that benefits them. These are called rent extractors. Rent extractors are the most dangerous in any kind of economy. And they're a problem with patents. So in Silicon Valley, one of the things that they worry about are what are called patent trolls. Patent troll is somebody who tries to patent. In fact, recently there was an example where somebody had tried to patent sweep left, sweep right. I came up with that. That was my idea. Well, it, it wasn't your idea. Yeah, but nobody else patented it. That's really not something you can patent. But if they had, anybody who used sweep right or sweep left on a, on a cell phone, on a smartphone, would have had to pay them a fee. So patent trolls, people who try to patent obvious parts of hardware or software and then extract money for it are the modern mud farmers. There are a lot of people who hire lawyers and try to make money as the modern version of mud farmers. Now, the reason we call them trolls is that the story is the troll sits underneath the bridge, you try to cross the bridge, and he demands a goat in payment. So a patent troll is somebody who sits under a piece of technology, and if you use it, threatens to sue unless you shut down your company. Well, you're not going to do that, and so you pay them. So there are plenty of opportunities for private rent seekers. The problem is that if you get stuck back with that technology, you're not really using the car. You're just going along with a horse. So it's a pretty bad system. You want not to have rent extraction. We want to, maybe we want to have patents, but we don't want rent extraction. How can we have one without the other is the problem that we face. And we talked about this with steamboats. Governor Ogden had first tried to compete and had a little bit, but he was forced by state police to buy a license. Once he paid for the license, he had to hire lobbyists to protect its value. And that license is a lot like a taxi medallion. If you've taken Uber in San Francisco or New York, the taxi drivers really hate Uber and Lyft because they have a rent. That rent is the promise of the state only to allow taxis with medallions to provide transportation services. Well, what's the role of mergers and acquisitions? And it's hard to know. A merger might be done with attempt to monopolize. It may be a form of a contract in restraint of trade. So if I approach you and say, let's both raise our prices 20%, and you say no, I'll say, all right, I'm going to go in the stock market and I'm going to buy your stock and then there will only be one company and I'll be able to raise the price. It's the same thing. On the other hand, mergers and acquisitions are a way of policing inefficient management, synerg synergies in product lines, supply chain, economies of scale, and reducing transactions cost. I might buy my upstream suppliers because I really want to guarantee myself a source of iron or a source of chips. So some big computer companies buy a chip maker as a way of ensuring they have access to their upstream supplies. 
So are all mergers and acquisitions anti-competitive? No, most of them encourage competition. But you can imagine a merger or acquisition, normally called M&A, again, I think they, they thought about calling it Beatrice, but instead of Beatrice, they call it M&A for mergers and acquisitions. M&A is primarily a mechanism of ensuring, ensuring competition, of disciplining inefficient management. And if you get lucky, it may be that one of the stocks that you pick is subject to a takeover, because often that will increase the price of the target. It doesn't always increase the price of the acquirer, though, the company buying it. Sometimes the acquisition really harms the company that's buying it. So antitrust laws are designed to outlaw private rent seeking. Whether they do that or not, I think, is debatable. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Antitrust laws are often used as a way of protecting industries from competition, but they're designed to prevent private rent seeking. So we can outlaw private rent seeking, which makes you wonder, is the problem the rent or the rent seeking? Remember, a rent is a return above normal. Rent seeking is the energy, time, and resources that are dissipated in pursuit of the rent, and rent extraction is manipulating the rules or the physical environment to facilitate the collection of those rents. Well, the original robber barons were actual barons in the Rhine River Valley in Germany. You asked two questions. A monopoly is a rent because I'm not subject to competition and so I can charge a price much higher than my cost. So I can charge a price that's the maximum that consumers will pay. Whereas, I, so suppose there's only one grocery store in the state of North Carolina. They're the only, one, only place I can buy water, they would charge a really high price. If there's even one other grocery store, then there would be competition. So the question is, how much is being a monopoly worth to a company? Well, it's worth the difference in price they could charge between competition and monopoly. So a monopoly can charge a much higher price and make higher profits. So the rent is the extra profits. The rent seeking then is how much I would pay a member of Congress to define my industry, maybe to give me a patent. So I have a patent saying, I invented grocery stores. And you can see this throughout history as states would sell monopolies like the right to sell salt. If you're the only one who can sell salt, you can charge a really high price. But the, the competition to acquire that rent meant that the state got paid. Examples of rent extraction. This is a drawing of the Rhine. And these red dots are castles. Now, that's pretty impressive that there's so many castles. But there's an odd thing. You would expect that the castles would be up on the hill for defense purposes. They're not. The castles along the Rhine, if you take a cruise ship along the Rhine, the castles along the Rhine are not up on the hill. It's not like they're trying to defend themselves against attackers. So our, the story that's interesting begins in about 962 and ends in 1250, at which time the Holy Roman Emperor controlled tax collections. So, the Holy Roman Emperor eventually in 1250 acted as the controller, but between 962 and King Otto and 1250, there was a different system. And it looks like this. Why are there so many pretty castles? In fact, people who go on this cruise say, why are there so many pretty castles? It was nice of them to build that. No, no, it was not nice of them to build that. What are these? These are mud farmers. These are toll booths. So if you have a ship or a barge and you're taking iron ore or other products along the Rhine, and this is pretty hilly, there's no railroads, there's almost no ro roads. So the Rhine is a major thoroughfare for traffic. These are toll booths. You have to pay a toll here, you pay a toll here, you pay a toll here and here and here and here and here. Well, if there's enough toll booths, 
How many times do you try to take something through? Once. Because you know you can't make money because they're going to charge too much. So there's a collective action problem among these robber barons. The robber barons are actual barons who made castles to try to collect tolls from river traffic. So there was an actual war. Philip von Hohenfels versus the Rhine League. The Rhine League recognized, it was a group of these barons, they recognized they needed to coordinate because if we all charge too much, there won't be any barge traffic and we won't be able to make any money. So we have to limit the amount that we charge. But I have an idea. You limit the amount you charge. I don't think I'm going to. And you have the same idea. And so negotiations broke down over and over again. So what did they do? They fought a war. That's why there's castles. Originally, they were just toll booths. All you needed was some guys with arrows and maybe a trebuchet that could throw rocks. Because if you throw a rock, it's going to break the barge and it'll sink. So with a little practice, you can easily have a catapult or something that's going to throw. This is before cannon. So the first cannon in Europe were probably 1350 or 1400. China had them by 1150. But the first workable cannon in Europe were after 1300. So this is before cannon. The reason there's castles was that they had to defend themselves against the other toll booths. The reason there's castles is they had to defend themselves against the other toll booths. Because I would come by and say, you don't get to charge. Oh, I think I do. And so there was an arms race to build castles that were large enough to protect each of the toll booths. Still, there's no barge traffic. What's the cost of things we don't see? Well, how much growth was prevented along the Rhine River Valley by the fact that all commerce was stopped by mud farmers, by rent extractors? So they hired an army to destroy castles unless, wait for it, unless they paid tribute. So the army became the new rent extractor. I had to pay money for the right to charge money. So again, it's an auction. They're going to auction off the right to charge money. They're charging money for the right to charge money. And it turned out that it was better if someone controlled access to the right to charge for the right to charge for the right to use the river. And you probably could have gone a couple more steps with this, but eventually the Holy Roman Emperor said, look, I was talking to God, okay? He said, stop this. Plus, I've got a bigger army than any of you, and I'll kill you if you don't. So he had two powerful arguments. First, you will die, and second, when you die, you'll go to hell. And so, eventually, they started charging tolls that would allow barge traffic, and economic growth started again. So the League sought through a general peace along the Rhine for the security of trade routes and the suppression of unjust new tolls. The League further sought to reduce the onslaughts of the feudal lords through economic sanctions and the destruction of robber castles. So the rent is the fact that you can make money by having barge traffic along the Rhine. The original rent seeking was people who were trying to push these barges through. The rent extractors said, I'm going to take that or I'm going to shoot you all with arrows and sink your barge with a catapult. Then rent extractors said, well, wait, the real thing to do is own these castles. Let's attack them. So wave after wave of trying to capture that original rent which was profits that are created by trade. But what happened was they killed the goose that laid that golden egg because trade stopped. There were no profits, there's no rent, and so there's no ability to charge anything. So when we think of property, the right to move or exchange property to create new value, 
a right to charge tolls. No, this is not a road or a bridge. They didn't build the river. If I build a bridge and then charge to use the bridge, maybe there's some value created. But if I just set up a toll booth and say, for you to come through here, I'm going to charge, is not great. Well, in an allegory, steamships had worked the same way. The New York legislature was the Holy Roman Emperor. Fulton was the existing castles. Ogden was the new castles that were paid for the right to charge. And Gibbons was even more new castles, new ships, and commerce. So charging new tolls without limits actually kills the goose. There's no more golden eggs. The war over the right to limit the tolls was pure rent seeking, a pure dissipation of resources. So if you actually fight a war, it's a pure dis dissipation of resources. The two harms then are exchanges that don't take place and the dissipation of resources, the fact that the rent seeking wastes all of the resources people used in war. I, I got this the other day on Facebook. If your age is 50 to 54, you can be approved for Social Security disability benefits even if you're still able to perform sedentary work as long as your past work was not skilled or semi-skilled or if you don't have a transferable skill to other work. To learn more about the special rules that can make it easier to get approved for disability benefits over the age of 50, click below for a free evaluation by an experienced Social Security disability advocate or attorney. There are companies that are advertising what good rent seekers they are. They're saying, we will get you Social Security disability benefits where the state will pay you every month for the rest of your life provided you don't work. Now this program may have a perfectly good reason for existing. There are people that are disabled. There are towns in Alabama though that one third, 33% of the population is on social security disability because they have some local lawyers that are really good at this. Doesn't seem fair that whether or not I get disability depends on how much I pay my lawyer. That should be a decision that is made on the merits. But in fact, it's a giant rent seeking contest. Social Security disability turned out to be a terrible idea because so much of the benefits go to my lawyer. I get this, this disability, but I have to pay the lawyer to get it. So much of it is dissipated for rent seeking. Now people might say, yeah, but I want poor people to get money. If you do, this is not the way to do it. This is a way to give lawyers money. If you want to pay lawyers, just pay them directly. End the charade about this being about poor people. Just pay the lawyers. Now, the modern robber barons, remember it was the Rhine River Gorge. If you've ever been to K Street in Washington, you might think of that as the K Street Gorge. For legislation to pass through this, they have to go through all the toll booths. K Street is where all the lobbyists and interest groups have offices, and they're big, lavish offices, and people look down from the windows, and they say, how can I prevent legislation from passing unless somebody pays me. And there's wars. There's wars among these interest groups. A lot of legislation gets held up. We would never know about it because it's unseen. These are, this is legislation that might very well be publicly beneficial, but interest groups stop it, just like the robber barons along the Rhine did. The robber barons along the K Street Gorge don't use arrows or catapults. They have really excellent Italian shoes, nice suits, good hair, silver hair. And when you shake hands, they hold your hand a little bit longer than you're comfortable with and maybe a little more affirmation. How are you doing? You look good. Have you lost weight? How's the missus? Yee. They develop personal relationships with members of Congress and they ensure that no legislation passes that harms their industry. How would we know if they're successful? We would not because we never hear of the legislation that doesn't pass. So rent seeking is alive and well. It's not in the Rhine River Gorge, but you can find it in the K Street Gorge. Commerce must pass through and the predators crowd along the passage looking down from their elaborate steel and concrete fortresses saying, how can I get me some of that? 
Well, in this case, the Holy Roman Emperor is the Congress, the robber barons are the K Street lobbyists, and the choke points are congressional committees. There are circumstances, and we'll talk about this, I just wanted to introduce it, there are circumstances where competition can solve this problem. Many buyers, many sellers, homogeneous, undifferentiated product, no public goods, no information asymmetries, and no large economies of scale. So we'll talk more about those as we go on through the class, but I wanted to foreshadow. So to summarize, because I've done a bunch of stuff today, exchange creates value. New products must pass the profit test. The problem is that accounting profits are both rents and actual profits. Rent seeking destroys value in pursuit of transfers, which are at best neutral. Creating rents is profitable for the authority that can extract those transfers. Plenty of private rent seeking exists. It's not that it exists only in the public sector, but it can be controlled by antitrust and competition. We might argue about the mix, but antitrust and competition can control private rent seeking. Unless it's the regulation itself that creates the rents. Thanks and I'll see you Monday. <laughs>